Good evening. My name is Reba Riley, and I will be your moderator for this class. Please. My sure your video is off and mic is muted. Welcome. No religious and scientific research or. organization dedicated to Shawn Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan, operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. The dean of Chicago North Side is Dr. John Quate. The president is Dr. Patrick Latortu. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit is manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name. Also, Elohim is a title. But unlike Lord and God, Elohim is the divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this day, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything we have. Yahweh and His Pure spirit stays symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that men could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word of son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, the self same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Joshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses the top Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we shall prove 
that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of the threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The objectives and aims of the Chicago Northside Zoom class are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually is this. Second, to form a nucleus, a universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua, the Messiah, without distinction or race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, a so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extricate, extirpate curtains, current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. Class will be dedicated in prayer by Myra Quaid. And the scripture lesson is Matthew chapter 18, which will be read by Lisa. And we all bow our hearts and minds. Heavenly Father Yahweh, we like to thank you for allowing us to know you and to understand anything definite and for sure about your eternal purpose, pattern, and plan. And thank you for coming down and being the savior of our souls so that we can live on in you and your righteousness. All these things we'd like to thank you for in the name of our Savior King, Yahshua Messiah. You can all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Myra Quay. Good evening. I will be reading Matthew, the 18th chapter from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New and Testament. And the scripture. Sorry, go ahead. Critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by the late A.B. Trainer of the Scripture Research Association. Matthew, the 18th chapter. At the same time came the disciples unto Yahshua, saying, Who shall be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And, and the Yah scripture lesson is... And Yahshua called unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of, Yah of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he would drown in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offense, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine aunt, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, 
rather than having two eyes to be cast into the fire of Gehenna. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be go gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother, thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the assembly. But if he neglect to hear the assembly, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a transgressor. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Rabbi, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, till seven times? Yahshua said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And, we had, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which, owned, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he excuse me, had not to pay his master, commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and entreated him saying, sire, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what thou owest. And his servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their master all that was done. Then his master, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all, thy, all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldn't not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. That was Matthew the 19th chapter. Thank you. Thank you for the prayer, Dr. Uh, Myra Quace, and thank you for the scripture lesson, Lisa Cook. If anyone is moved to scripture read tonight, please type it in the chat box. We thank you in advance. We'd like to thank all business teachers for joining our class today. The first speaker for this evening class will be uh, Dr. Lisa Cook. Lisa Cook, the first the first speaker for this evening class, would it be Dr. Lisa Cook? Good evening. Um, I'm happy to be here and would like to give all praise to Yahweh through his son, Yahshua the Messiah. Um, I will lay a foundation for the next speaker and um, probably won't be up here long. Um, 
this is a school and it's not a church. And I'm happy to be part of the school because there's things that I've learned in this school uh, that have really helped me uh, with the first aim of the school, which is to find and know Yahweh or Elohim, not as I had imagined him to be coming up in the Episcopalian church, but as he really is. And none of us would have any understanding of our Heavenly Father, who is spirit, had it not been for the vision that was given to the founder of the school, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. Uh, he had a divine vision in the year 1931, uh, and he was commissioned by Yahweh to um, share this vision or this teaching uh, with mankind. And uh, those that would hear uh, and believe would be saved, uh, and those who reject this teaching uh, or, the, uh, or the words of Yahweh uh, through his son, Yash Messiah, will be damned. And uh, it's a very serious thing, uh, what we're learning down here. Um, and, uh, and, and the punchline, if I could say it that way, it's really not a joke, but the, the bottom line is probably a better way of saying it is that the creator of heaven and earth dwells within you and he is ever present in his creation. Uh, and all the things that we see down on here in this earth plane points to the creator and his son. Uh, and we learn how to use these natural things on the earth plane uh, and, and leverage the scriptures, uh, particularly the so-called Old Testament, which is actually the law and the prophecy, uh, to prove that Yahweh is uh, and that he did send his son, whose true name is Yahshua the Messiah. The world calls him erroneously Jesus Christ. That's a bastardization of the true and correct name of the son. And um, the moderator already took you through the names, so we do use the true and correct names down here. Uh, we learn about uh, how we 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 learn understand who uh, Yahshua the Messiah is and his mission, uh, and we learn that. Get me John one and one through three, and John one fourteen, please. That <clears throat> the self same Creator of heaven and earth that appeared to the various patriarchs and prophets down through the ages and dispensations in visions. I told you the founder of the school had a vision uh, and also uh, the various patriarchs uh, and the prophets uh, and the apostles. See, they saw visions and, and, and received revelations of what they saw. Moses, uh, a prophet uh, under the old covenant or the old Testament. You can find him in the old Testament part of the Bible. You could see it. Uh, and, and Moses is attributed writer of the first five books of the Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you have John on the Isle of Patmos. He's an apostle. And he beheld Yahweh Elohim, or what your Bible would probably say, Lord God. See, in a vision and revelation. Uh, but this self-same spirit who's seen in visions and revelations and who created the heaven and the earth. See, according to the purpose of Yahweh, he got into a physical body and walked the earth plane known as Yahshua the Messiah. This is not God's little boy. This is the creator, see, manifest in the flesh. John 1 and 1, please. This is John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was Yahweh, and the word I'm sorry, and the, words, and the word was with Yahweh, and mm -hmm. the word was Yahweh. The same was in the beginning, with Yahweh. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. Sorry, go ahead. Down to 14. I'm sorry, was that three? Go ahead and read yeah, them. Okay. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay, so I just want to establish that they're talking about this word or son, which was already discussed um, with the moderation. See, word or son, this is a divine title. So Yahweh Elohim is Yahweh in incorporeal, let me say it this way, super incorporeal shape and form. See, and the self-same Yahweh Elohim or this word or son, not the Bible word, but the word or son of Yahweh, that super incorporeal uh, body, uh, he's in the shape and form of a man, but without fleshly counterparts, okay? He was made flesh. So let's get the uh, witness of that in John uh, 1, 14. 14 verse. Then the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
Okay, so the word was made flesh. So just establishing the unity of the spirit, that Yahweh, who is spirit, as recorded in John 4, 24, it states Yahweh is a spirit. But then according to this divine vision, we understand that when putting that article A in there, it makes it seem like there's more than one. But Yahweh is the ultimate source. Madhuri said this, the ultimate source the immaculate and incomprehensible inscrutable principle. See, he's the all in all. See, and Yahweh or spirit consists of these, I shouldn't say consists, but he is these nine divine attributes being intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength. These nine primary attributes came together into a set shape and form of a man and then manifest in the flesh. And that sets up the unity of the spirit. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, it states, Yahweh, our Elohim, is Yahweh, a unity. And in 1 John 5 and 7, it states that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, okay? So that sets up the unity of the spirit. And by looking at things that are made, Romans 1, 19 and 20, please, by looking at the natural things, as I mentioned at the top of this discourse, um, we, can, we can show the witnesses that give evidence that there is a unity and not a trinity. And we can begin to debunk uh, or um, prove wrong, see, the erroneous concept and opinions that we were taught when we were in the world, okay? When I was in the Episcopalian church, I was taught that there was three. There was, there was the father, the, the, the son, and they never, you know, really explained the Holy Spirit, that these were three separate, you know, spirits or, you know, individuals, or I don't know what it was. <laughs> and, uh, and basically the concept is called a trinity. Um, I've seen things like triune and all kinds of other um, ingenious, right, um, manifestations of that erroneous principle. Um, but really, it's downright diabolical. Okay, what are we holding? You yeah, have Romans one eighteen and twenty. Okay, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, but Yahweh has showed it unto them. But the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. Okay. And supernal nature is another way of saying the Godhead uh, or that unity that I was talking about. Okay. Now in the moderation, it also talked about a pattern and we find out that Elohim or this word or son is the archetype, which means original pattern of the universe. All things were patterned after him uh, and that he showed this. We're going to get the pattern scriptures, Exodus 24 and 9 and 10 first, and then 25, 8, 9, uh, was it first Chronicles? Um, Hebrews 8 and 5, if you wouldn't mind, please, getting those scriptures teed up. Um, uh, but I'm going to go to this pattern. So <clears throat> this pattern actually is an example. It, it's a pictorial illustration uh, so that you can see kind of the inside of what was going on in the pattern that was given to Moses in a vision atop Mount Sinai after he led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, or he was commissioned to lead them out. Um, and they followed a cloud. And remember the moderator told us that a cloud represent, the cloud represents spirit. And we know that spirit is Yahweh. So he often uses a cloud to depict himself. So when we see that cloud, we're looking at spirit. When we see oil, we're looking at spirit. Okay. Um, and there's other, you know, physical manifestations that can point back to spirit, like air, see, gas, and we'll go through a few of those examples. So <clears throat> we can better illustrate this pattern that Moses was admonished to make in the wilderness of Sinai here on this chart. And it was a most holy place, a holy place in a court roundabout. It was threefold, yet one tabernacle, because it testifies or it bears witness, it's evidence that the uh, Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are, are one. They're not three. OK, so let's go ahead and get those scriptures. I want to just go back to this idea of a vision, because without uh, well, there's a scripture, I forget what, the name, uh, what it's called, but it says without a prophetic vision, the people perish. So it, it, we're not going to know anything about our invisible creator 
um, without him opening up our understanding. Um, but it's the it's these uh, types and shadows or what we call, you know, these natural examples that can help solidify our faith. OK, let's get Exodus 24. I think it's nine and ten. This is Exodus 24 and 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven and its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. Okay, so he didn't lay his hand on the people here at the plateau of the mount. We have even this uh, mountain, um, I could, if I could say it that way, you've got the bottom, the base of the mount, you've got the plateau of the mount, and you had the top of the mount. See, threefold, and the children of Israel were down here at the base of the mount. Uh, they had been delivered from the bondage of Pharaoh and his host by taking out a lamb, piercing in the side, putting the four points of blood on the inside of their door, um, and then eating the meal that was prescribed down there so that the death angel, one of the 10 plagues, or the last plague, uh, in Stingent Black Darkness, was that they would put that blood on the door, um, slay this lamb, eat this meal, and that, that death angel, when they saw that seal on the inside of the door, would not um, allow the firstborn of that house, man or beast, to be slain in that home. Um, and, and they're following the dictates of what Yahweh had told Moses uh, to the children of Israel. They had to believe that report uh, and do as they were told so that they could escape this bondage. Um, and Egypt is representing a spiritual and psychological state of not knowing anything about our creator. Uh, and there's a pres prescribed way that we're going to exit that type of uh, bondage. And that's through a death, a burial, a resurrection, and an ascension. And the reason why it has to go that way is because not only is the pattern, which is uh, Yahweh Elohim himself, Remember, we're using this natural tabernacle pattern to show forth spiritual principles. Not only is it threefold or it has that as structure um, in, in addition to its nine vessels, but it also has steps. Uh, and the steps are, you know, you could see them with this high priest operating day by day, continuing you see, in this uh, sanctuary. Uh, and that one day a year going up into this most holy place on the day of atonement to be in the presence of Yahweh, to behold a vision uh, and be shown whether the children of Israel's sins have been forgiven for that year, okay? So that's representing the operation or the function. And the high priest is going from a death, death killing those sacrifices, which were the atonement for sin, uh, washing them in the laver, um, having to be anointed before he could even enter into the priesthood, into the officiation in this tabernacle, going into this holy place, that's that resurrection, going through this second veil into this most holy place at one time a year, ascension, right? Before what would be the throne of Yahweh. So you have a death, burial, resurrection, ascension. You've got nine steps. You've got, I'm sorry, nine vessels and three um, steps. So everything's following this pattern. So back to our children of Israel, See, Yahweh, can you get the scripture that I know what I'm holding with the tabernacle scriptures, but could you get from me, I would like when Israel was a child, I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. See, because this collective body of people uh, were referred to as Yahweh's son. You could also, and this was in a previous lecture, he, it, you could refer to them as his bride. You can refer to the body of Israel as his, the woman. See, because the only true man, let's get that too, that thy maker is thy husband. So that makes him the true man, see, in this relationship or in this covenant that they entered into by vowing that they would do everything that Yahweh had spoken down from this mount. But first, see, this tabernacle had to be given um, and, and then it had to be constructed in the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, so let's get those two scriptures and we'll go back to our pattern scripture. When Israel was a son, what it was a child, I, I love Hosea 11 and 1. Mm -hmm. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. 
Now remember, I told you they left here by the blood of the lamb. They went through the divided waters of the Red Sea. They followed a cloud. That cloud, remember, what did I say? It represents spirit. See, so they resurrected out here in the wilderness of Sinai, and they were able to be told how Yahweh wanted to be worshipped at that time. See, okay. What was the other scripture? Um, Thy maker is thy husband. Yeah, please, because that's the true man. So I just want to establish that you've got this, and we call them, right, the children of Israel. Okay, this is Isaiah 54. And um, do you want to train a thought or sure, just... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, start it for. For not for thou... I'm sorry. For not for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded for thou should not be put to shame for thou should forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore for thy maker is thine husband Yahweh host is his name and thy redeemer the holy spirit of Israel uh, Yahweh of the whole earth shall be shall he be called Right. He's the Elohim or Yahweh of the whole earth. See, um, and so I just want to establish that he's the true male. So this tabernacle had to be erected in the wilderness of Sinai. And it took 40. Uh, wait a minute. I'm getting my thing wrong here. How long did this take? Uh, 40 weeks, right? 40 weeks. Yeah, it was 40 weeks to construct this tabernacle. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that. I'm starting to lose it. OK, so. Um, so you've got your 40 here. Now, um, let's go ahead and get the tabernacle scriptures, because I, I just want to establish that he, he Yahweh Elohim, did admonish Moses to build this tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai, just like the one he was shown in the mount. So I think we're on Exodus 25. 20, Exodus 25 and 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Okay, so everything had to be made according to this pattern. And I kind of took you through a little bit of that with this this pattern. See, you've got a principle of um, an, uh, sin sacrifice or fire or death. You've got a principle of burial or immersion. You've got a principle of spirit. You've got a door that opens up into this holy place. You've got principles of light or illumination. You've got sustenance where the uh, priests were able to eat the 12 uh, of the 12 loaves of bread that were on this table of showbread. Uh, you've got this altar of incense that waffled up an incense into this most holy place. And it took away the stench of the burning that was going on down here, the dead sacrifices, okay? Uh, and then you had this three-in-one configuration of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, wherein was laid the um, uh, command, the Ten Commandment Law, Aaron's rod that budded, um, and the cup of, whole, I'm sorry, oh, the hidden manna, cup of hidden manna. Uh, and Yahweh said he would dwell above the cloud between the wings of the cherubim above the mercy seat. All right. So this is important because this is the first um, vessel that was made. So, okay, let's go back to 25. I think we finished 25, 8, and 9, right? Mm -hmm. So let's get, let's get. Um, 40 chronicles. Verse? Oh, yes, please. 40 okay. verse would be good. Okay. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which we showed thee in the mount. So everything's being patterned after Yahweh Elohim or this word or son. Remember, he's the archetype, which means original pattern of the universe. It's like a blueprint. See, everything's going according to him. And by showing forth that everything is controlled and operated by Yahweh Elohim, then we can have some confidence and faith in the operation of this pattern. So, um, and, and, and it's constant repetition of death, burial, resurrection, ascension, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. Okay, let's get, is it First or Second Chronicles 28 and 19? It's First Chronicles 28 and 19. All this said David, Yahweh made me understand and writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. Okay, so it was important that there's that hand again. Remember, Yahweh Elohim did not lay his hand on these people here at the plateau of the mount. That would mean that he didn't give them an understanding of what they saw. They saw it, but they... Uh, but they did not understand because his hand was not laid upon him. But he did reveal to Moses these things. And um, and then David, who was commissioned to, well, 
he got the blueprint to build Solomon's temple, but he actually turned over those specifications to his son Solomon, and it was Solomon, his son, that built the temple. And that has great significance because Yahweh, our father, um, he, he, he put all things in Yahweh Elohim. OK, uh, and he turned that over to son. And what what's happening is, according to the purpose of Yahweh, there's a body being built, a body. Remember, I told you the children of Israel could be a body, a wife. You could call it the creation versus the creator. Right. There's that those two principles that are constantly work. And he is his purpose is to build a body. OK, and that body is going to be made one as he and his father are one. But that's the mission of Yahshua Messiah. And that's why this blood had to be shed. This is the true lamb of Yahweh, of which this lamb back here in Egypt was just a type and a shadow. But it really prefigured or it, it showed that it had already been ordained that Yahshua the Messiah would come and, and, and die for the sins of the world. Okay, let's get, uh, I think it was Hebrews 8 and 5. So I'm just trying to show through the Bible um, that this tabernacle is spoken of. This is Hebrews 8 and 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Right. And what we do see is that you've got Aaron, Nadab, and Abayu beholding this vision. And we see that Yash Messiah did fulfill this vision that was seen in showing himself to Peter, James, and John. Okay. So you had Aaron and his son, you had the elder Peter, uh, let me make it a little bigger, James and John here, okay? So you see how Yahshua Messiah, the things are already written down in the uh, law and the prophecy that they're actually being fulfilled in Yahshua Messiah. So we see this tabernacle also being uh, mentioned here, but, but we won't get that right now. So uh, I just wanted to show forth this pattern is very important. And just going back to Solomon again, remember David received the specifications and how was he shown the inner workings of this pattern or the workings of this pattern. It was shown by his hand upon him. So you can look at that as being given an understanding. Uh, and you can also see that David's physical body was also um, used for him to be able to understand the workings of that pattern. And that's why we have man by the pattern, see, set up in the self same configuration because Paul Yes, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what, know you not that your body is a temple or a tabernacle, uh, which you have of Yahweh and you're not your own? See, we're supposed to worship Yahweh, our Elohim, in our body and in our spirit, which are his. See, we're not our own. And what do you know? It takes 40 weeks for this particular tabernacle or temple to be built, right? So when a baby is conceived in the womb, it takes nine months or about 40 weeks for that baby to finish. Uh, and we can't really see whether it's a baby boy or girl at conception, but as the baby takes on shape and form in the womb, which would be likened onto this holy place, um, you can begin to see uh, the baby, but you can't do that with your physical eyes, right? You need an aid to your natural vision, which would be likened onto a vision and a revelation. And that's the only way you're gonna see Yahweh Elohim. So that type and shadow of a baby in the womb is what we use as our natural example to help you understand the principle of having to have a vision. See, but something is being formed. Remember I told you a body's being formed, okay? He's the head and we, uh, or those believers are the body. Okay, now, okay, so I'd like to get the scriptures that talk about um, Yahshua Messiah's fulfillment because he had a mission, and I alluded to it earlier, right? It's to make us one as he and his father is one. Uh, and what he did was he, through the sacrifice of himself, he brought about salvation. Now, what did we need to be saved from? That's the question we need to ask. So let's go to this chart, which is called the pat pattern or plan of salvation chart. 
And we can see that the, our various Bible stories are written out in pictorial illustration, uh, and they're also in a threefold configuration. And these are all what we refer to as plates. Uh, and remember, I, I told you that Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, they went up and they saw the Elohim of Israel. Uh, and it said in that scripture, which is Exodus 24, 9 and 10, it said that they did see Elohim and they did eat and drink. Now, when I first came to class, they would say it this way. They didn't go up there with a picnic basket. Okay. So that we're not talking about natural eating and drinking. Remember the natural things point to the spiritual things. So as Yahweh Elohim is speaking, we are hearing those words and the ear tries words. That's in Job. You don't have to get it as the mouth tastes meat. Okay. So in eating and drinking, we can do that with our ears. Okay. Um, meaning we're taking in what we're hearing. Uh, and that in itself is like an entree. Okay, so what we're seeing here is um, the reason why salvation had to be brought forth. What, forth what, did we, what did we need to be saved from? We needed to be saved from the wiles of the devil, bottom line, okay? And we can see that even in our, what, you know, what the world referred to as the first book in the Bible, we understand that you had to exit out of the, you know, they had to exit out of Egypt and, and resurrect, if you will, in principle, into the wilderness of Sinai, which would be likened unto the holy place as compared to the tabernacle, in order to learn something about how Yahweh wanted to be worshipped at that time. And they had to hear his words, and they were responsible for obeying, see, those words of Yahweh. And they said, all that Yahweh said, we will do and be obedient. Remember the scripture about thy makers, thy husband? So they entered into a covenant or a contract. They heard the words. They said they would do what they were told. Um, and that was like unto a marriage ceremony. Well, there was also a command that made here with uh, Adam and Eve. It said, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, except the tree that's in the midst of the garden, because in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, Eve was deceived by listening to or eating the words that were spoken from this satanic spirit who entered into the garden and beguiled her. She was deceived uh, and she gave the fruit that she was forbidden to eat to her husband. That was an olive, but we'll call it fruit, which is a fruit. Uh, and uh, he did eat. He willingly died for his bride. Why? Because Adam, this first Adam, is a type and a shadow of the true Adam, which is Yashem, Messiah from heaven. See, this one's dying for his bride or his assembly or his body or his children. Okay. Um, and so they go down in their, well, she'll say it this way. They, because of this disobedience, it's like turning your back on Yahweh. And oftentimes you'll find that Yahweh Elohim referred to like an unto the sun, S-O-N. Well, this physical S-U-N in the so sky went down when Adam and Eve transgressed. And that's because this S-O-N just died in his heart and mind. Now he physically walked out of the garden. So you may say, well, okay, the creator of heaven and earth told him he would die, but he was just joking because he did walk out of the garden. No, no. You have to see that that was a spiritual death that took place and that his physical body followed 930 years later. But time began when they uh, left this garden because that's when the, the earth starts to move. And uh, I believe it's a 24-hour uh uh, cycle on its own axis that bring about day and night see here in the earth plane from a natural perspective see but when adam and eve let's call it in principle turn their back on the son see that darkness came on their heart and mind can you get um romans eight and three and that carnal mind not being able to perceive spiritual things is a death. And it's Yashamasai's mission to reverse that state and condition and bring mankind, those who believe in him and his resurrection, back one with the creator, with the creator, back in communication with the creator. Because you see how they, well, they were, well, there's another chart where it shows that they were at peace and harmony in this uh, in this garden until that third party, Lucifer and his hosts, came in here. See. And, and perpetrated a lie. And that's why it's so important that we ask for discernment down here because the different doctrines that can be eaten, right? You're taking that stuff in, it's an intercourse, all right? 
look that word up. It's not always what every you know what people think. It's an exchange of ideas. You're eating. Uh, you're you're taking this stuff in. Have you ever heard of the term food for thought? Okay, so these doctrines, they can either be building you up or they can be tearing you down and you can be walking around here looking just as healthy as can be from a natural standpoint. But um, let's get this scripture too. the Messiah told those scribes and Pharisees that they were full of dead man's bones, see, because they look they adorn themselves outwardly, but inwardly they were they were not well, see, or they were dead. They were like they were like graves. So this body. Can be a ta it's a tabernacle, uh, but it can also be a grave. A grave for what? The dead soul. See, so that soul has a resurrect from that state and condition. So anyway, I wanted to show you this these two uh, plates because um, they show Adam and his him being um, created from the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. And then he was put into a deep sleep. That's your death. He was immersed in the spiritual uh, immersion. Uh, and then spirit uh, pulled, uh, took a rib and a womb from this man and made uh, the woman, the bride, or the creation, or the um, uh, his his offspring. Okay, and maybe I say it that way. And um, then they were uh, placed in this garden, uh, and you see they're they're at peace and they're at harmony. And you see how the animals are not devouring one another. There's a lion here. You know, I was just watching the news and my daughter uh, just moved from a place where there's a lot of bobcats. And I used to worry about her because she likes to hike. And they just had in the news this uh, brother, uh, these two brothers that were hiking in California. And they uh, were mauled by a cat. One of them was killed and the other one was not. But anyway, I, I bring all that up. This is not a bobcat. This is a, a lion, the king of the jungle, right? But you see that he's here with this lamb. So this is just showing a principle of peace and harmony or a, a being at one, okay? Um, not being at, at odds, right? And, and that's the state and condition that was lost when Adam and Eve transgressed. Okay, what am I holding? Well, I'm holding... Um... I don't know if you still wanted to fulfill my scriptures. And also I was holding Romans 8 and 3. 8 and 3, please. All right. This is Romans 8 and 3. Mm -hmm. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, Yahweh sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh and, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we're not walking after the flesh. You know, what's that flesh, you know, natural flesh? No, we're not walking after those carnal or physical things, those things that are actually the type and the shadow of the true reality, which is Yahweh Elohim himself. So um, let's go ahead and get uh, the... Mission of Yahshua Messiah. Then I want to get the scriptural lesson because I just want to show forth another principle of fulfillment after that, and then uh, I'll have my seat. So let's get the fulfillment scriptures. Did you want the scribe and Pharisees um, bones? Oh, yeah, the graves. Yeah, okay. please. Let's get that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is Matthew 23 and 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like unto white wall sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Thank you. Okay. What else do we have? So, um, I got Matthew 5, 17. Mm -hmm. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, all the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, so shall in no wise pass from the law, to all be fulfilled. Now that scripture, I believe this Matthew, the fifth chapter, like you said, and I, I uh, in my Bible, it's called the quote unquote uh, Beatitudes. And Yahshua Messiah is uh, on top of a mountain. He's talking to um, a multitude, see, see, just like you had, um, and I was reading a transcript, I think it was, and uh, Dr. Kinley talked about it being um, like a mixed multitude, and that would be likened unto fulfillment where, because you had these 600 and 
what's this? I forget the number. Six hundred and five thousand. I forget the number. You guys are gonna have to help me with that. Six hundred. How many people came out of Egypt, not counting women and children? I think it was. It was, a, it was a mixed multitude. See, so he had like a mixed multitude that he's speaking down to from this mount, just like he spoke down to these people into their hearing down here at the mount. See, okay. Um, if you remember the number, just shout it out. Okay, so. Let's get 603,550 the other. fighting men. Uh, uh, thank you. I knew there was a five in there. Okay, 603,550. Thank you, Dr. Latour, too. All right, so let's go ahead, uh, Matthew. I mean, um, let's get John 539 and um, is it Matthew 313? This is John 5 and 39. Search the scriptures. For in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So, so everything testified to Yahshua Messiah. Remember, I was saying that this lamb down here, it was, uh, it was foreshadowing that this, uh, that Yahshua Messiah, who is really the reality of what this four-legged lamb pointed to, an innocent sacrifice for sin. Well, this is an innocent or. Uh, innocent sacrifice so that these people can make a journey from death like state onto life from a natural standpoint. Well, you've got Yahshua Messiah who's bringing us from death from a spiritual standpoint to life from a spiritual standpoint. Okay. And it's through his death. You have four points of blood on him. You had four points of blood back here. They had to eat all the words of Yahshua Messiah. They had to eat this lamb and they had to eat it in haste. They had to go through the divided waters of the Red Sea. Well, Yahshua Messiah was buried in Joseph's new tomb. The uh, waters parted here and came up in a heap so they can go through on dry shot. Well, Yahshua Messiah came out of this tomb. He resurrected just like the children of Israel resurrected. Uh, uh, the cloud represents spirit. So you had to have an angel that rolled this stone away. OK, uh, and then Yahshua Messiah, where I was trying to go with all this. Oh, let's get Luke 24, 27 and so on. Uh, and then let's get Matthew 27, 51. I think it is. Let me slow down. Go ahead and get those scriptures. This is Luke 24 and 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So I've just given a few examples that you'll hear quite often when we're, you know, on the floor, um, how the scriptures or the law and the testimony point to Yahshua Messiah. And even Isaiah, and I, you'd have to get Isaiah 53 or the 53rd chapter, he talks about how um, he's prophesying that he, he Yahshua Messiah, was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. So Isaiah is prophesying of Yahshua to come. This lamb back here in the law with Moses is prophesying of, of Yahshua to come. So when Yahshua comes, there's no need for these sacrifices anymore that was set up under a law because he is the ultimate sacrifice. There's no need to be baptized in water. And, and, and these people didn't get wet when they walked through here. See, uh, there's no need to be baptized in John's baptism of repentance. What John? John the Baptist. See, because when Yahshua Messiah was baptized, he was baptized for all. That fulfilled its baptism back here of these people. It fulfilled the baptisms that took place in Solomon's temple. They had many baths uh, there. See, uh, all of these things are pointing to or being fulfilled by Yahshua Messiah. He was buried in Joseph's new tomb. And when he came out of this grave, or when they came out of this um, tunnel, see, they resurrected out here um, a mighty body or an army. So that's why you'd have to have a body, Yahshua Messiah being the head or the husband, and these being the bride or the wife or the son, see, or the children, just like the children of Israel back here. Um, and it may not be cleared from this lecture. I'm not doing a great job with this, but uh, we're spanning good 1500 years of history here. See, with, um, you know, from the time that Moses uh, and them came out of the land of Egypt, uh, all the way to the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua Messiah. That's a long time. And they were given this law, not because uh, the, you know, they were given the law to point out that they were sinners and they needed help or to point out that they were in need of a savior. See, 
or to point out that they were dead spiritually and psychologically. And it's only through Yahshua the Messiah's death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit can we be made alive. And that death that I talked about earlier, that of Adam and Eve, um, it's it's um, addressed by childbearing. Uh, and that son or that seed is Yahshua the Messiah is to come. Okay, now, what am I holding? Because I, I, what I'm trying to do is get to talk about these children of Israel coming out of here and how the scripture lesson talked about don't suffer the, uh, the children, don't like, don't prevent the children from coming on to me. Okay, so what scriptures do we have before we get that one last? The scripture lesson last. Is I that think it's Matthew 3, was it 313? Did okay, we yeah, let's finish getting that. And uh, I think we got Luke already. Okay, this is Matthew 3.13. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh thou to me. And Yahshua answering said unto him, Suffer it be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered all right, thank you. So that's just another witness of the fulfillment. Okay, so um, I was just thinking of something here and I just lost it. Uh, um, okay, that's, um, what, what do we have next? Do we have the scripture lesson? Oh, I know. I wanted Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Is that John the third chapter? Um, because, um, and let me just set that up while you get it. Um, in order for the children of Israel to ultimately get the inheritance that they were promised, and I left that out, right? There was a promise given to Abraham that in his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Um, and he had, um, you know, sons, and then they had sons, and then you had the children of Israel, right? So you had Ishmael and Isaac, and then Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot uh the 12 sons and uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So that's how you get the sons of Israel. So Yahshua Messiah's lineage came through that, that line. Okay. But he said he would make a nation. Uh, he would, he would make a great nation out of both of his sons. And so ultimately the goal is that um, the children of Israel would inherit this land flowing with milk and honey. And, that's bringing them back where they started from. Just like in principle, Yahshua Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection brought Adam and Eve back where they started from. And all who died in belief from Adam on down to Moses or everybody down to uh, those under the law till Yahshua Messiah is coming and his death, burial, and resurrection, all those who died in belief, see, they would come back to uh, be redeemed uh, and that would be representative of these sons of Elohim, see? Um, and they came after Yahshua Messiah's resurrection. And you see the sun rise here? It's a little small. But remember how I told you with Adam and Eve's death, the sun went down? Well, now the sun is rising with Yahshua Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, when he died on the cross, the sun went down for the, uh, well, it got dark, I'd say it that way, from the sixth to the ninth hour, from 12 to three o'clock, okay? The sixth, uh, 12, I'm sorry, six to, yeah, six to the ninth hour, uh, you start counting from 6 a.m., all right? And that's how you get 12 o'clock, and three o'clock when the scriptures say from the sixth to ninth hour. And so when Yash Messiah was on the cross, it got dark. See how all this dark here? And it says sundown here. See, but when Yash Messiah resurrected early in the morning, the sun in the sky has to go up because this sun, which is the reality of what's going on in, this, in the heavens, is uh, rising or resurrecting, not alone, but he's the head and they're the body. Okay, so let's get Nicodemus because these children of Israel, they I'm going back to the law just to show you the point I'm trying to make with Yahshua Messiah. Now, the children of Israel, they had to, the old heads, as we call them, the people who originally came out of Egypt, uh, we were just given the number of 603,550 uh, fighting men, uh, not including women and children. So there was a very large multitude of people out here. Well, they all died off, save three. And the three that did not uh, die off, they uh, 
went into Canaan's land under the leadership of Joshua's son of Nun with the newborn who were born out here. And the reason why they had to be three is because they would represent the unity of the spirit that we went through earlier. Uh, and so when the old heads died off, see, that's like not to that old man or that carnal mind dying off. That's what these children of Israel dying in this wilderness, because he told them to do their disobedience. They would be roaming around in here till the carcasses fell. OK, and so that came to pass. But it's a type. It's a shadow. It's an allegory of the old man having to die off the flesh. Remember, I told you the flesh is not speaking about something physical, but we have our physical type here in the wilderness of Sinai so we can understand the reality of Yahshua Messiah's mission. Right. So their carcasses fell off. They who the old head and the newborn 144,000 that John saw in the Isle of Patmos. Remember, I told you he had a vision of revelation. He's looking back at the beginning. He's looking at the things that happened with Moses and the children of Israel. And he's writing about it in the book of Revelation. A lot of people misunderstand that book and think that that's something to come. Those things, you got to go back into the law and the prophecy see, to uh, understand. I won't get into that right now. Uh, but the new newborn had to go come forth. And then under the leadership of Joshua, the son of Nun, whose true name is Yahshua, that's a whole nother lecture, uh, they were able to go into this land flowing of milk and honey and inherit the land. And, and this inheritance is likened onto a round trip or returning back where they started, which, you know, in this analogy I'm trying to run, is back one with the creator. And as the man is a tabernacle, you know, he's tabernacle in here, body, soul, and spirit. That soul has to make a migration as well, but it's not a physical migration. It's a spiritual migration from darkness and bondage to erroneous concepts and theories that are perpetrated by these demons down here, spouting off lies. See, you have to be uh, uh, washed of those erroneous concepts. Um, it talks in the scriptures about being washed because the People were covered in their own blood and that he was going to wash them. Uh, and Yahshua Messiah even talked about the words that come out of the mouth are likened unto a water, see, and they do wash or cleanse, see. Uh, and then we have to follow Yahshua Messiah, the spirit, so that we know how he wants us to worship him. And it's not according to works, lest any man should boast, as a state, see, in the, in the Bible. There's no works that can be done. These works were given to the Jews and the Jews only, and they could not keep those these laws that were given to them. That's why they were continually offering up sacrifices. But those sacrifices were really pointing to the true and only acceptable sacrifice, which is Yahshua Messiah. And the prophecy that Jeremiah wrote uh, in Jeremiah 31, 31 came to pass because now the new covenant, so you remember they entered into a covenant, they, the children of Israel, with their husband from uh, Mount Sinai, and they said they would perform these things. Well, Yahshua Messiah said that he hasn't come to destroy these things, but to fulfill them. So we nailed him to his cross. He ushered us into a new covenant, or a new testament, beginning with the Jews, who was originally the covenant was given to. Uh, but then, like he told Abraham, all families of the earth would be blessed. The Gentiles would not be left out. So again, those who believe in him, see, they are going to have this new covenant written in their heart and mind, and they won't be following this old one because that would deny that Yahshua Messiah came in and did what he said he was going to do. If you're over here eating Passover suppers or the bastardized Lord's suppers, um, you're basically saying that his words are not enough. You got to continue to eat this type in the shadow. If you are continuing to get water baptized as a form of salvation, then you're saying he didn't do the job well enough. And when he was baptized by John the Baptist, that that wasn't good enough, that you're going to continue to do it. Or worse set yet, you're saying that he didn't come yet. You're still waiting for him to come. And that's why you're going to continue to do these things. See, it's really bad, very bad. So um, we understand that he's the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. This this covenant is written in the heart and mind, and that is what New Jerusalem above represents. Ooh, uh, five minutes, I see it. So let me get this chart back up. Sorry. Um, so let's go ahead and get the scripture that I wanted. All that set up so that I could just share. I uh, was talking to one of the brethren. We were talking about... Um, uh, the transcripts and um, it talked about how Yahshua Messiah in the scripture lesson said, suffer the little ones to come unto him because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And you can see that he's fulfilling what happened back here with the children of Israel. These children came onto him and gathered around this mount, and they ultimately came back into this land flowing with milk and honey. But you could see how the children of Israel would be like the institution of that. And, and Pharaoh tried to not allow those children of Israel to escape this bondage. And that's what's going to happen to you and I. These satanic spirits do not want us to be one with our creator uh, and follow him and not another. So they're going to do everything in their power to uh, thwart, see, the spiritual rebirth, which um, I won't get um, Nicodemus, but if you read John, the third chapter, uh, Nicodemus is asking Yahshua Messiah, how can he be born again? He can't go back into his mother's womb. And Yahshua said, that's not, you know, basically that's not, you know, they have to be born again. It's more after the spirit, not after the flesh. Okay. Um, can we get the scripture lesson and I'll get down? I, I, I'm looking specifically for where he's talking about the um, little children. Okay, I am getting that. And Matthew, okay. I think it was the 18th chapter. 18 and, okay. There's one in 19 and 14, but you want the one in the scripture lesson, right? Yeah, I was just trying to tie in the scripture lesson, but you can read what you have. Okay, let's see. Matthew um, 19 and 14. Okay, Matthew 19 and 14. I'll start at 13. Then were there brought unto him little children that he sh should put his hands on. Him. I don't think that's the one you want. You well, maybe get 18 and, four, 18 and 14 as part of it. I'm kind of okay. Uh, phone here. Oh, here it is. Um, you know what? Start at three. Okay. Oh, no. I mean, you know what? Start at one. Sorry. Just start at one. Okay, Matthew 18 and 1. And at the same time came the disciples unto Yahshua, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Yahshua called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Continue. Go to six. Okay. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Six. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he would drown, drown in the depths of the sea. Right. And on 14, it says, even so, it is not the will of your father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. So I just wanted to kind of see in principle that these children of Israel are likened onto that child, and um, that the there's an attempt to keep those children from coming onto Yahshua Messiah, those who believe in Yahshua Messiah, so that they might be made one or reconciled with the heavenly father, go from a carnal mind or death to a spiritual mind or life and peace. So with that, I'll say hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Lisa Cook. And our second speaker will be Myra Quake. Hello, Myra. Uh, one second. Okay. Good evening. Can you hear me? No? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, I uh, enjoyed the remarks of the previous vessel. And um, I don't have anything particular on my heart and my mind. I'd like to just, just give Yahshua Messiah honor, glory, and praise. Because he is all that we 
have in this uh, crazy wicked world that can deliver us and keep us in a state of mind where um, we are not just um, going off. So I, um, like I said, I don't have anything particular in my heart, my mind, but um, I did enjoy um, the remarks of the previous vessel and I'm just going to um, yield the floor and praise Yahshua and Messiah for allowing me to know anything. With that, I'm going to say hallelujah. Uh, call uh, May, you the next speaker. The next, John, you said the next speaker will be? Uh, May. Hello? Good evening, uh, class. I'm not feeling the greatest this evening, so I'm thankful. Next to speaker will be May Cohen. Yes. I'm not feeling my best this evening, so I'm thankful to be here, but I'm going to yield the floor at this time. Thank you. Uh, Mariah Coleman. Okay, thank you, May. Okay, I'm sorry. Give me one second. Good evening, brother. Um, I probably won't be on the floor long either, but um, I really enjoyed the words of the previous speaker. She definitely covered a lot of ground. <laughs> um, but one thing that has been on my heart and mind lately is um, what she talked about in the beginning, about the unity of the spirit. Um, we can uh, get uh, if we can get Romans 1 and 20 but I want it out of the King James version of the Bible I'm, I gotta catch my breath okay go ahead Romans 1 and 20 Romans 1 and 20 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the... Did you want me to start at 19, Dr. Coleman? Um, no, the, the 20th verse is fine. 20th verse? Okay, I'll start over. Romans 1 and 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Right, so right there, what uh, I believe it's Paul is writing to the Romans. What he's telling us is that the Godhead, or Yahweh, Elohim, Yahshua, can be understood by the things that are physically made in the creation. And if we take a look at the uh, Moses chart here, we see that Moses, when he's having his panoramic vision of, of Elohim, that he first sees Yahweh Elohim. And what it says right there on the chart is Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua um, in that one figure. And then, um, Elohim shows him how that threefold tabernacle pattern um, 
uh, that it's fashioned after him. And then you see half of Elohim right there showing that he transfigured back into himself. And then he continued to show Moses how he made the creation, the physical creation, by the pattern of himself, by Elohim. And that the physical tabernacle pattern is just um, a detailed explanation of showing us how these physical things on earth are are uh, pointing to the Godhead. Um, I'm trying to think of <laughs> where to start. I kind of want to go back to Exodus, the third chapter, um, and read like the first 15 verses of the chapter. <sighs> that might be a good place to start. I can help read. You Exodus oh, three, you went one through fifteen. Yes, please. Thank Exodus you. Exodus three one through fifteen. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Yahweh, even to Horeb. Okay, and you can pause. You can pause right there, mm -hmm. um, because Moses he's out here in the land of Midian because he had when he was living in Pharaoh's household in Egypt, he ended up killing one of the Egyptians to protect the, the Hebrew slaves or one of the Hebrew slaves. And once it was known that um, he had killed an Egyptian, he had fled out of the land of Egypt for his life. Um, so it was the, that's like a death. And then he buried that Egyptian in the sand. And then he resurrected into the land of Midian with uh, Jethro Ruel, and Ruel meaning friend of Elohim. So he's out here, um, and it seems that he is on the run in a way. Um, but Yahweh has separated him out here in this wilderness because he's about to. Um, Reveal to him his name. So you can continue reading, please. Two. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Mm -hmm. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Now pause right there. Mm -hmm. So we already, it already seems like we have three different people in this bush. It talks about the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him. And Yahweh saw an Elohim called unto him. Um. So according to, if we read it in the King James Version, which I'm not going to have you do, because I'm not trying to be on the floor for long. But what it seems like when we read the King James Version, it says the angel of the Lord, the Lord and God called. So according to their Trinitarian concept, because if you actually read what they believe, um, in Christendom about the Trinity, they believe that the Godhead is made up of three distinct personalities, three distinct persons. Like um, the way they describe it is when the Lord is talking about himself, he says, I, but if the Lord is talking about Jesus, he says, you distinguishing that they're two separate persons. Um, and they say that the Godhead is not God playing three different roles. But what we've come to learn in this school is that Yahweh is pure spirit and everything in the universe is made from that source and substance of that pure spirit state. 
And what he did in the beginning of the creation, before he made the angels, before he made the physical creation, is that he um, took on shape and form within himself as this form of Elohim. Um, and this in this form of Elohim is the form that he took on to start creating the creation. And the whole creation abides within Elohim. So uh, we can see how, I mean, Yahweh is infinite, like beyond our imagination. We can't think upon how vast and how great he is because a creation is just within uh, Elohim, not to even talk about how Yahweh is an eternal uh, life-giving spirit. So Yahweh and his pure spirit say, took on shape and form as Yahweh Elohim. And later on, he took on physical form as Joshua first, back there with Moses, but also as Yahshua the Messiah. So it was really Yahweh himself, Yahweh, that pure eternal spirit. He came down all the way out of his pure spirit state without taking away from his, from the spirit. Um, he came all the way down as a man. And he was Yahshua the Messiah as a man, Elohim, and fully conscious in the pure spirit state all at once. So um, what we teach here is that Yahweh is a unity. And I forgot what scripture it is. Deuteronomy, is it six and four? Yahweh or Elohim is a unity? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think I would like to get that. And then I also want to get John um John 1 and 1 1 through 14. Okay, this is Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one. Right. So Yahweh our Elohim is one. Um, so it debunks that Trinitarian concept that these three are th three different persons, but Yahweh our Elohim, he is one. I also would like to get that John one and read through to verse 14. But also, hold Exodus for me. All right. This is John 1 and 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from Yahweh, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which light of every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave him power to become the sons of Yahweh, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of men, but of Yahweh. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you so much. So it states in that passage, 
a passage that he was in the world and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. So it's showing that the self same one who made the world, who made the creation is the same one who came down and walked on the earth. And what he did was, is he took on that physical uh, body, both to institute and to fulfill. And we see that on this chart that it shows both the institution um, with Moses and Joshua in the tabernacle and how that started. And it also shows the fulfillment when Yahshua came in to fulfill all that was written about him in the scriptures. So what we see is that, you know, there's a purpose going on and Yahweh does have a plan. And um, we've what we've come to learn by the spirit of Yahshua are all the mysteries of his will. And we see how that our lives even play by our, or go according to the uh, tabernacle pattern or the pattern of the universe and how that uh, uh, we learned that how that the blood, the water and the spirit or death, burial, resurrection, it just repeats over and over and over. And um, right what we say in the moderation that uh, everything in the universe goes by a tabernacle pattern and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. So even the devil can't escape the pattern. He's going to go by a pattern as well with his mass murderings and all, all the horrible things that he contributes to the world. It goes by a pattern. Um, so I think I would like to oh, go back to Exodus 3. I think we left off uh, the fourth verse. Okay, Exodus 3 and 4. And when mm -hmm. Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Right, and I forgot where the scripture is. It uh, uh, says, the eye of Yahweh is everywhere beholding the good and the evil. So we can see how, how here, how that Yahweh being ever present at all places, all at the same time, that he, he saw. And Yahweh Elohim speaking to him in that vision, um, Elohim called out to him out of the midst of the bush. Um, because like our founder has said, if we had been standing there next to Moses, we wouldn't have seen anything because that angel of Yahweh, which is Elohim, who's an Elohim is just a title. His name is Yahshua. So he's appearing to Moses in a vision like the, the bush is burning and it's not being consumed. And it's not being consumed because that fire is a vision. And it talks about, oh gosh, I think that's some Deuteronomy 4 and something, I think, where it talks about how Yahweh is a consuming fire. And that's why we have Yahweh. Um, he, he's drawn like a cloud around the edges of the chart, but not just a fluffy white cloud, but he's drawn as a fiery, consuming, consuming fire cloud, um, because that's what he is. So um, I keep getting, I feel like I'm going down little rabbit holes. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the uh, sixth verse, please. Exodus 3 and 6. Moreover, mm -hmm. he said, I am the Elohim of thy father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon Elohim. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh Elohim said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. 
and I have come down to deliver them out of the land, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Mm -hmm. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. Yep, you pause right there. Mm -hmm. So you, we see here, um, really, if we go back to Abraham, that's when it really all starts. But I don't want you to read all the way back there. But Yahweh told Abraham what he was going to do until, uh, unto the lineage of his children. And he had a plan for them to bring them down into bondage for 400 years, about 430 years. And to bring them up. Now, they were accustomed by that time. They were accustomed to slavery. But Yahweh, by the strength of his arm, he brought them up out of the land of Egypt through what we would call miracles. And that Red Sea had divided, but their journey wasn't over yet. They had to get into a shape and form as a nation of people under the king, um, Yahshua or Yahweh, because Yahweh sat um, on the seat in the most holy place in that tabernacle pattern. So the people were still being divided. Um, there are lots of conflicts going on in the wilderness. Uh, we hear about Nathan, Nathan, and Korah, and it talks about them in the Elohim book, volume, I think it's four, um, the conduct of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And Yah Yahweh called Nathan, Nathan, and Korah a satanic trinity because they went up against Moses. And there were lots of instances where, you know, they had to pick what side they were going to be on, um, either the idol side or on Yahweh's side. And uh, those old heads or the elders, they had to die off in that wilderness because they had those Egyptian uh, minds, carnal mindset in them. And so we just see through the process of, you know, being in Egypt and being in the wilderness is really a uh, proving ground for them. But Yahweh brought them through as he promised Canaan land. So we can see how the journey of going down from Canaan land with Abraham down into Egypt and then from Egypt going back up into Canaan land, showing that round trip of Yahweh and how that he came down out of pure spirit, took on shape and form, like how they had to take on shape and form in the wilderness, and then came and died on the cross um, in a place that's spiritually called e Sodom and Egypt. And what he has to do is he has to take off the, the veil of the flesh and go back um, as Elohim. And we can see him on the other side, uh, next to John, that when he went back up to the Father, now he is glorified um, and magnified. Just like when he goes back, uh, just like how the children of Israel went up back into Canaan land, now Solomon, who was the son of David, he had to build the temple on Mount Moriah, the same place where uh, Abraham was told to kill his son, Isaac. And Yahweh stood his hand. And uh, it was to show that, that faith that Abraham had. And that's the same faith that we need to have um, as a son of Yahweh. Oh, thank you for that. Um, as a son of Yahweh, we, you know, we're supposed to have that same faith. And this, this migratory pattern really takes a picture 
of course, of our life, but really about um, the migration of our soul going back into the true temple uh, of Yahshua the Messiah. And um, we we talk about how the temp the tabernacle came out of the temple, the spiritual temple of Yahweh, and then the tab physical tabernacle uh, substances on the inside of the physical tabernacle went back into the t the physical temple um, uh, in Canaan land. Um, let me see what you guys put in here. Okay, so I guess let's get uh, Hebrews 12 and 25. Um, and Proverbs. Thank you, Casey. Proverbs 15 and 3. This is Hebrews 12 and 25. Mm -hmm. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuseth him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Okay. Proverbs 15 and 3. Yes, please. The eyes of Yahweh are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Yes, thank you. And then there is another one, uh, Exodus 24 and 17. Okay, Exodus 20, 24 and 17. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is Exodus 24 and 17. <clears throat> and the sight of the glory of Yahweh was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount and the eyes of the children of Israel. Thank you. Okay, so we can actually, we can now that I got those that were entered into the chat. I'll go back to uh into Exodus the third chapter. Um let me see where we left off. Okay, at uh, the eleventh verse, please. Okay, Exodus three and eleven. And Moses said unto Elohim, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Mm -hmm. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. And now, but Mm -hmm. so Moses saying, who am I that I should go down there? Because Moses is thinking he's got to go down there, you know, by, by himself. But Yahweh said, certainly I will be with thee. You know, you're, you're not, um, you're not doing this alone. This is, this is Yahweh's purpose and he's going to, he's going to do it. Continue, please. Well, and he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve Elohim upon this mountain. Continue. Yes, please. And Moses said unto Elohim, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers have sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And mm -hmm. Elohim said unto Moses, Aya Asher Aya. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Aya have sent me unto you. Continue. Yes, one more verse, please. Okay, 15. And Moses said, Moreover unto, I'm sorry. And Elohim said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, the Elohim of Jacob, have sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So Yahweh is telling him, this is my name. Now, this is the first time that the name of Yahweh has been uh, told to mankind. And it's with the power of his name that he is going to deliver these people out of the land of Egypt. 
Um, because at this time, Pharaoh is the most uh, powerful man in, in, in the world at this time. And so um, I, I don't want to get in, into a lot of detail, but Moses has to go down there. And what is performed um, by Yahweh are those 10 devastating plagues. And um, Yahweh tells Moses, you know, you know, Pharaoh's not going to let them go. His heart is going to be hardened. Why and how does he know that? Because he's going to be the one to harden his heart. There, there's a pattern and a plan of salvation going on here, and Yahweh's in control of it all. And uh, well, ten plagues are like what? You ten toes on your feet, and they be stinking sometimes, don't they? So, you know, <laughs> everything goes according to this pattern, even your physical body. So in the last plague, they were told to take out a lamb. And this is what's coming up the same days that we're having these uh, the event. Now, April 10th, take out the lamb and hold it over until the 14th, right? And so they had to take out the lamb and they had to kill it. And, they, and the picture is down there in Egypt. We can see it. They killed the lamb. They put the blood in the basin, put that at the bottom of the door. They took that hyssop and they hit the lintel and the two side posts of that door, showing that how Yahshua said, I am the door. And it was his blood that was put on the cross. Um, his, his head had that crown of thorns beaten into his head. And what did they have to do back there in uh, Egypt? They weren't just lightly painting the blood on the door like an art piece. They were putting their hand all the way back and slapping the blood uh, on the door. There was blood everywhere. Just like Yahshua, he was a bloody mess. And so that door was... Um, their way out of that land of Egypt. If they didn't put the blood on the door, then their firstborn would be dead. And just like now, if we don't have, if we don't partake of the blood, like he said uh, to his disciples, you must, excuse me, and you must eat of my body and drink of my blood, you know, to have a part of him. That's what we have to do now. We have to have the blood of, Yahshua in us and it's not by taking you know crackers and grape juice and munching on that but it's about um taking in the gospel um uh, that has been presented to us the true gospel of the kingdom and that's that's really what's supposed to be the theme song of our school I know I hear a lot of people say that Romans 1 19 and 20 is a theme song but uh, it's really Matthew 24, 14 and 15, how that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world for a witness unto all men and then shall the end come. So it's this gospel um, that has to be preached. And that's why everybody's on YouTube uh, presenting this gospel to the world and um, Zoom, being able to connect with people all over the world to present this gospel. And that's what our aim and objective is so that we can go home. I know that we're all tired and sick and can't take it anymore. I get it. Um, and we're all ready to go home. So I guess... Just, I just want to encourage everybody to just keep going. It's going to be over soon, and it's and it's worth it. You know, the sh little struggles that we have down here, and they are they are little compared to what is to come for eternity in our eternal life. Um, so, with those few words, I like to say hallelujah. Thank you. Okay. Hallelujah. Rose is next. Good evening, everyone. 
Um, I just like to thank Yashua for giving me another opportunity to come to class and to learn something about him. Um, I enjoyed the remarks of the previous speakers and um, I just want to give all praise and honor to Yashua the Messiah for allowing me to be here. And I, I don't have much on my heart and mind, so I'm uh, I'm gonna yield the floor. All praises go to Yahshua the Messiah. Kiana. Thank you, Rose. I would like to say I enjoyed all the speakers tonight and it was really informative and uplifting. And I really enjoyed each and every speaker tonight. I yield the floor now. Okay, uh, is Kiana there? Good evening, class. Um, I'm, I really enjoyed the remarks of the speakers um, or the Holy Spirit speaking through the vessels. And I am thankful to be able to be here and to to listen to the gospel be preached um i don't have anything in particular on my heart and mind so i'm going to go on ahead and heal the floor hallelujah praise yahweh do his son yashua the messiah all right uh we can just open it up. Anybody have a testimony? I know nobody really had anything that was going to take any length of time. So perhaps someone has a testimony, a quick testimony that they want to give. That would be fine. The floor is open. Quick testimony. Earlier today, I was talking to Yashua and, you know, just talking to Yashua. <clears throat> and um, I looked up and while I was talking to him, what I was talking to him about, I saw on the back of a man's shirt that said faith. <laughs> and I'm just <laughs> thankful that he shows me that he's with me in the, the, in the big ways and the even the smallest things, just to be able to uh, meet us where we are in our heart and our mind is um, is something that I'm thankful for. So that he continues to do it the same, do it the same way over and over and over to be able to catch my attention. And I know he does other brother in that way. So to, to that's why he deserves all the honor and the praise. So hallelujah. Hello, brethren. Um, I would like to say that uh, I enjoyed the previous speakers this morning. And I would just like to uh, encourage the brethren to uh, continue in the faith because uh, the songs are being worn out. And uh, I would just like to encourage the brethren to continue on with the with the inheritance. And um, going through this whole process of having to deal with a lot of things concerning uh, the passing of my husband, you know, uh, I was looking up words like, uh, well, no, I had to deal with, you know, uh, beneficiary, inheritance. So, you know, Yahshua had me looking up those words. And even though beneficiary and inheritance mean, uh, sim they're similar, meaning that you will inherit something 
from someone's passing. Uh, it is much better to have an inheritance because that is something that once you seal with the Holy Spirit, uh, Yahshua will not take that away. Um, when you deal with like a beneficiary of some sort, uh, that could be subject to change. Uh, so even though those are those words are similar, I would say I, I you know I only can encourage the brethren to continue on with the faith. Uh, your true inheritance is in Yahshua the Messiah and is not of material things of this world. Uh, and when you see that other people are, uh, I would just give you know an example. Um, me and my granddaughter, uh, we have went to the mall to exchange something. And uh, I kind of stopped in a store uh, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't go to the mall for that particular reason, but uh, like I said, we went to exchange something, but we, I was walking past the store, so I stopped in and um, I was asking the young lady the price of something and <laughs> everything I picked up, she was like, oh, uh, you know, I just work here. I'm not the owner. I don't know why there's no prices on these things. And uh, it's like, well, you know, if you can't give me a price, I'm not just, you know, I'm not going to buy it. So anyway, she appeared to get a little frustrated. And so I was like, well, maybe we should just leave <laughs> because she seems like she's a little irritable. She was there by herself. And she was also, when you go to a mall, they get these little kiosk stores out, you know, like in the middle of the mall. So she was manning the store a retail store, and she also had three kiosks that she had the man. And she said they all belong to the same owner. I'm like, now, how can her eyes be in the store and who's buying stuff on the outside on the key, at the kiosks? So I could see her frustration. But uh, after it was said and done, I made a really, really small purchase. And so um, we were headed out the door. And then she proceeded to try to show me the kiosks. It's like, no, I'm not buying nothing else. But we got to talking. And I tell you, she went from being frustrated to that. She just wanted someone to talk to. And uh, it's just it's, it's really uh, good to see that we have a comforter that we could go to and 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 talk to when we're and when when we're in our times of tribulation because um she was just like this it's gotta change this world just has to change and I just your heart just goes out because it's like it makes you humble and it makes you realize that you are blessed beyond measures to know that uh, we have a comforter to go to and um uh, you know, she just, you know, it is like, okay, I got to hurry up and go. And she just, she just needed somebody to talk to. I mean, it didn't start off that way. Like I said, I could see why she was really irritable. And um, so you, you just never know what somebody's going through. And um, I would just encourage the brother to just continue uh, in the faith and, um, just, you know, try to talk to Yahshua when you're going through tribulation. I'm definitely speaking to myself because uh, it's definitely has been a trial for me. But uh, he's making me realize that true inheritance is just in him. And, um, we'll, you know, we'll be going home soon. And we're definitely in the right place. And... Um, it makes you feel like you've won a uh, million dollars when you know um, you have someone to turn to other than this flesh. Um, and with that, I will give all honor, praise, and glory to uh, Yahshua the Messiah. 
Hallelujah. 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 Hi, um, my name is Kenyatta Jackson, and I'll give a brief testimony. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I just uh, want to thank uh, Yahweh through his son, Yahshua Messiah, for all the things that he has shown me. And I just, you know, what I get the most out of class is that Yahshua's love. You know, he loved us from the foundation of the world and he loved us in our filthiness and our sadness and our joy. He just loves us unconditionally, just like any other parent, you know, love their child unconditionally, no matter if they do right or wrong or anything like that. He just loves them unconditionally. And um, I just want to encourage the brethren to just to, you know, hold on, you know, he's wrapping it up and um, I'm looking forward to the event coming up and um, that we just got to keep our heart and mind focused on him because we all know that there's a lot of distractions out there in the world and um, the devil, you know, what this what was said from the floor, I enjoyed what came through all the speakers, but he wearing us down, you know, he wearing us down to lose faith and not have hope. But we have to be like, you know, Nathan Cora, hold the hands up, hold each other up, lift each other up in Yahshua, not for nobody to get no honor and glory but him. But we just got to, you know, hold on to Yahshua because he's our only hope of glory and our only salvation. And I'm just going to read uh, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Um I sent this to the brother today that was going through some stuff. I'm like, you know, I can't help you. You know, only Yahshua, he is your strength. Lean in on him for strength. And it says, uh, now all things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonishment upon whom the end of the world are come. Whence for let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fail. 13, this is the verse I wanted. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to a man. But Yahweh is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So whatever he puts us through, because he's the one that's putting us through it, he's going to make you be able to bear it. He is the comforter. You just have to cry out to him and he will get you through. No for surety. That's where that faith come in that, that he's the only one that can get you through. Because when you're alone and by yourself and nobody's there, He's right there with you, just like uh, John, uh, I mean, Richard David always says, you know, he's right there with you having a bad day. But, you know, I like another brother and always say that you have to experience Joshua for yourself to know that he is real and he is with you always until the end of time. And um, that's all I'm going to say right now, but just keep encouraging and monitoring each other keep coming to class learn all you can because he's about to wrap it out and you want him to say when you stand before him yashua well he's well you and if you get anything from me all honor praise and glory go to yahweh elohim through his son yashua messiah and with that i'll say hallelujah Okay, so that's it, uh, Reba. Reba, you can end class.
We can't hear you. Class, can you hear me? Now we can. Hello? Yeah, now we can. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Reba. Hello? We can hear you. Hello, we can hear you. We can hear you, Reba. Can somebody, somebody else close the class, please? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello? Hello? Western Hotel at 4400 Francis Road in Hillside, Illinois. Um, um, we meet on Sundays from 12 to 2 p.m. And we meet on Mondays and Thursdays from 7.30 to 9.30 on YouTube and Zoom. Uh, two Thursdays are in person, which will be announced on a monthly basis. And our next in-person Thursday meeting will be this coming Thursday, March the 28th at 7.30. And thank you for studying with us. And thank you for all the speakers that came forth this evening. And, Go ahead, Kenyatta. And uh, our uh, next in-person will be on uh, April 15th, Monday. That will be another in-person meeting in April. May we please bow our hearts and minds for the exology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, to Yahshua Messiah, our Sovereign, be long glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all times, now and ever, let the class say, hallelujah.